Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the last Science Unwrapped event of the 2020-2021 season. And what a year this has been. Okay. My name's Greg Podgorski. I'm Associate Dean in the College of Science. More importantly, okay, I am Chair of the Science Unwrapped Committee. And more importantly, I've got a really good large committee that's fully engaged in Science Unwrapped behind me because they're, they're the ones behind all the work. I will introduce Dr. Silvano Martini in full in just a moment, okay, but I've, I've got some more intro to do. Uh, Dr. Martini will be speaking about chocolate tonight, and the, the full title is Molecules, Crystals, and Chocolate, Oh My. I think you're really going to enjoy this talk. As you might guess, we're not in our standard recording studio, but we're at the USU Aggie Chocolate Factory. This talk is gonna be a little bit different from many of our talks because this portion is pre-recorded. But Silvana and I will be at the recording studio live Friday evening for the Science Unwrapped event. So as you're watching this talk, please be sure to, to send your questions in to the question and answer feature of our Zoom webinar. And uh, Silvana will be there live on Friday evening to answer your questions. So, so get your questions in, please. I want to give some thanks. I got, got a lot of thanks to, to give uh, for this year's Science Unwrapped. First, thank you to all our speakers. Okay. This has been, as you know, an extraordinary year, and our speakers have had to, to really step up and do extraordinary things, and they really have done that. And I, I, I thank from the bottom of my heart our speakers for our Brave New World series of this year. Another big thanks, as I've said, is the Science Unwrapped Committee, who meets monthly and really does a, a super job in organizing these talks. So, so thank you to everyone on the committee. I want to thank our volunteer groups who have stepped up this year. So there are 15 online science activities at our Science Unwrapped website. If you haven't seen those already, be sure you see them soon. They'll be up for, for quite a while, and there'll be some really fun things to do with you know, your family, with whoever you want to do some science uh, activities with. So people put in a lot of work on that. And, and last but not least, I want to thank USU Media Productions who have made these events possible this year uh, where we haven't been able to do our live events. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, next year's theme, so I don't know if I had a drum roll here, I, I'd ask for a drum roll, okay, is going to be science on the horizon. And what the, the committee wanted to do was actually to, to contrast what we've done this year, Brave New World, a, a darker dystopian themed uh, set of talks that look at the promise of science tempered with the, the potential dark sides. Next year, we're going to turn things around and look more at the promise of science as hopefully we come out of the pandemic. And if we come out of the pandemics, the pandemic is going to be largely due to the contributions of science. So a, a more positive theme for next year. So watch for, for details on that series coming out soon. Silvana, okay, it, it's your turn over here. So let me give the introduction now to Silvana. And Silvana is a researcher in food sensory perception and food chemistry. And you'll see both those things being merged together in Silvana's talk tonight. Uh, Silvana is a professor in the Department of Nutrition, Dietetics, and Food Science here at USU. We have been lucky to have Silvana with us for 15 years, actually going 16 years now. Silvana came to USU in 2005. Okay. She has a bachelor's in biochemistry from the University of La Plata in Argentina, a PhD in food science from the same university. She's done a postdoc at the University of Guelph in Ontario, all that before coming uh, here to Logan in USU. Silvana has published over 100 papers in a variety of topics in food science. She's won numerous awards, both national and international. And she's editor-in-chief of the Journal of the American Oil Chemists Society. So a lot of accomplishments. And Silvana and I have, have, have been friends and known each other for quite a few years now. So there's a close tie. That's the standard stuff. Okay, here's the fun stuff. So we're here at the Aggie Chocolate Factory. 
And Silvana is director of the Aggie Chocolate Factory from its inception. I think you, in fact, are a large reason for why there is an Aggie Chocolate mm -hmm. Factory. So right. thank you very much. And along the fun things, too, Silvana teaches. And this, this is one for the young people in the audience thinking of going to college, okay? And all of you ought to be thinking of going to college. Um, it's not all hard boring classes. You might, if you came to USU, be able to take a class in the science and history of chocolate and guess who teaches it, all right? So, so you know, please, uh, please consider that. And then a few little bits of news that just came up uh, before uh, this recording, and that is uh, Silvano told me that the Aggie Chocolate Factory has just won the 2021 Best of State Award in the culinary chocolate category. So that's something to consider when you pick up your samples of chocolate for this talk. And if you haven't done so already, okay, there's still time to do so after the talk. I hope you've got those now, but if, if not, you can, uh, you can eat along okay, after the talk. Silvana will make reference to chocolate in all its various forms, and there are samples here at the Aggie Chocolate Factory for you to pick up. Okay. So what I'd like to do now is turn to Silvana and ask the question we've been asking all speakers this year. So tell me about your path to becoming a scientist. Well, Greg, well, thank you very much for the introduction first. And uh, well, my path uh, to become a scientist was a little bit of a coincidence, let's mm -hmm. put it that way. Uh, so as you said, I have a bachelor's in biochemistry. And during the last year of my college education, I took a class that was uh, related to food science. So we learned everything about food science, and I really liked it. And uh, so I liked it so much that I approached my professor back then and asked her if I could join her lab uh, as a volunteer, as an undergraduate volunteer. And she said, yes, of course, and I got hooked. So I started as an undergraduate researcher and then I applied for scholarships to do my PhD and I went, I, I dove in into my PhD right away. So I would encourage everybody that is in college under a science uh, major, uh, even if it's not a science major, get involved. Get involved and try to do some volunteer work with your professors because uh, it's a great experience and it really gives you an idea of whether you like a topic or you don't like a topic. <laughs> great. Thank you, Silvana. Thank you. <laughs> so I really look forward to your talk. Okay. I will be taking off my, well, actually, I'll leave my mask on, but Silvana will be taking her mask off during the talk, and then we'll, uh, you'll see us back in the recording studio after the talk. So, so please submit your questions, okay, during uh, Dr. Martini's talk. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, everybody, for being here, and it's a pleasure uh, for me to talk about chocolate every time somebody wants to talk about chocolate. I'm there. I love to, to tell people about um, chocolate business and chocolate science. Uh, so as Greg said, the title of my presentation is Molecules, Crystals, and Chocolate. And the idea is uh, for you to learn today what is involved in chocolate making and how important these molecules and these crystals are. Uh, so but before we start, I want you to be aware that uh, we have some samples available at the chocolate factory for free. And, and those, those uh, samples should be, you should have a little packet that is, uh, has an A, uh, those are cocoa beans. Another packet that is labeled with a B, those are cocoa nibs. And another packet uh, that is uh, labeled with a C, uh, that's cocoa powder. A, a packet that is labeled with a D, that's cocoa butter. And then a little uh, envelope that is uh, labeled with an E, and that's, um, that's a bloomed chocolate, untempered chocolate. So we're going to go through these samples through the, through the presentation. So keep that in mind. I'll let you know when to grab them and what to do with them. If uh, we also have at the factory like an upgraded package that you could purchase for about $4, and that brings uh, uh, samples of the chocolates that we make at the chocolate factory, uh, and that's just for you to, to experience the different flavors of, of chocolate that we can achieve by basically changing the source of the beans. Uh, so if you have those packages, again, keep them, uh, keep them handy because we're going to use them. Uh, if you don't have them, you can always pick them up later. We're going to have them available at least for a week and, uh, so that you can pick them up and, and re-watch the, the, the video, the talk, if you want. So let's uh, dive into the talk right away. 
Uh, I always like to start my presentations by talking about the history of chocolate. And that is because uh, chocolate evolved so much over the years. Chocolate is a very ancient um, product, but you will see me talking about cocoa when I talk about ancient, ancient chocolate. And that's because uh, cocoa was consumed very, very, very long, a very long time ago, maybe about 3,000 years ago, by a civilization called the Olmecs. And this civilization was placed in Mesoamerica, and they consumed the cocoa itself, the cocoa bean. They didn't really have sugar, and they didn't know the concept of chocolate. So chocolate is a modern invention that appeared basically in the 1800s or mid-1700s. Uh, so cocoa, again, was first consumed by the Olmec civilization. How do we know that? Uh, because very smart people at Hershey, at the Hershey Company, have created very uh, fancy methods to determine the concentration of two compounds that are present in cocoa. They are theobromine and caffeine. They are two alkaloids that are present together. And cocoa is one of the only uh, products that have these two alkaloids together in, in, their, in their seed. So what they did is they went to different archaeological sites and started analyzing all the vases and all the materials that we could find from these ancient civilizations. And they found every time they find both theobromine and caffeine in those vases, they associate that with cocoa consumption. So really Olmecs were the first uh, uh, civilization that consumed cocoa. The Olmec uh, civilization was followed by the Mayans and, and then by the Aztecs. And really between the Mayans and the Aztecs is when uh, cocoa uh, started being used as a currency, for example. And the way they consume is totally different from what we, are, what we know these days as cocoa or as chocolate. Uh, they basically ground the beans and they made a very, very thick drink, very foamy drink. And they add corn and wildflowers and different spices to make it taste better because as you we're going to see in a little bit, cocoa beans are not very good tasting. They are very, very bitter and they're very astringent with something that a lot of people don't really um, uh, know what astringency is. Uh, so again, basically Olmecs, Mayan, Aztecs, and between the Mayans and the Aztecs, so all these are Mesoamerican civilizations, between the Maya and the Aztecs is when they started using cocoa beans as currency. Uh, so you can see now we can get, grab our first package and let's look, let's take a look at those cocoa beans that you have in there. So you can open that package you can grab a bean and just don't do much right now. We're going to play with it a little, in, a, in a little bit. So right now, just look at it. What does it look like? It kind of looks like an almond, right? And actually, the Spaniards, when they discovered Mesoamerica, they actually described cocoa beans as these new strange almonds, right? Very, very similar to an almond. And you can smell it. What does it smell like? Yeah, it smells a little bit like chocolate, but not too much, right? And we're going to see when we open it, the chocolate smell comes out a lot more than just right now with the shell on it. So just keep that uh, seed or that cocoa bean in, in, in your hand for a little bit. So as I said, uh, Aztecs and Mayans used uh, cocoa beans as currency. And this is an example of uh, the different ways they will use cocoa beans. So for example, if you wanted to buy a turkey hen, you will use 10 full cocoa beans. If you wanted to buy a small rabbit, you will use 30 cocoa beans. A turkey egg, three cocoa beans. A ripe avocado, one cocoa bean. And one large tomato, one cocoa bean. And one tamale, one cocoa bean. So my question for you is, how many cocoa beans will it will take you to pay USU tuition, or if you don't go to school, how many cocoa beans do you need to buy a new car, for example? Quite a bit, right? So you can always come and buy them here at the chocolate factory. <laughs> So really, uh, just to wrap this part up, chocolate evolved quite a bit over the years. Uh, as I said before, cocoa started being consumed by uh, Mesoamericans, and then in the 1600s, it was introduced to Europe by Spaniards. Uh, the funny thing that it was introduced more as a medicine than as a treat, uh, because it was this, again, this very thick, foamy drink that nobody liked, and it was very bitter and not very uh, enjoyable. But in the 1600s, 
uh, people started discovering sugar, uh, sugar trade became very important and they started incorporating sugar into cocoa and that really changed everything. And chocolate or cocoa became uh, to, to uh, transform into being a medicine to being something that people enjoyed. Uh, after that, in the 1700s, uh, the invention of uh, milk, ch uh, chocolate milk, uh, was very important. Where we could, they could add chocolate, uh, they could add milk to the chocolate and have this drink that we now uh, know as uh, hot cocoa. And uh, and then with the industrial revolution and the invention of the hydraulic press, um, they um, they were able to. Um, refine uh, the cocoa and obtain cocoa powder and, uh, and then invent also milk chocolate. So these two inventions, uh, cocoa powder and milk chocolate, are one of the two more important things that allowed uh, for the industry to produce uh, chocolate for the masses. Mm. Uh, so one important thing about uh, these cocoa beans are that the cocoa beans are seeds. Right? There are seeds that grow on a, on a, on a fruit. Uh, the fruit is called a cocoa pod, and, and that cocoa pod, that fruit, grows on a tree, and the tree is called Theobroma cacao. Right? The tree is very small and is very delicate, and it only grows in very specific parts of the world. It grows around the equator, 20 degrees north and 20 degrees south of the equator, so very specific areas. And even though cocoa started being consumed and grown in Mesoamerica, really 70 to 80% of the worldwide production of cocoa these days come from West Africa. And here we have a graph of the production of cocoa. You can see about 70% uh, comes from West Africa and from the, that 70%, uh, about 20% uh, uh, about 40-50% uh, comes from uh, uh, Ivory Coast and another 20 and 30 percent comes from Ghana. Mm -hmm. uh, so a very important uh, note here that uh, really the production of cocoa is not like when you go to the uh, to the Midwest here and see these uh, huge farms of corn for example, right? Cocoa production comes from more than two million small uh, family-owned farms. And these families, these countries, both Ghana, so countries in West Africa, Ghana, Ivory Coast, Cameroon, Nigeria, they are third world countries. So a lot of those, these farmers, not all of them, but a lot of these farmers don't have enough education and they really don't, um, don't uh, make use of the farms the best way that they could. The yields are very low, so that means that they don't produce as much as they could. And that's because they don't know better. Some of them, they don't even know what those cocoa beans are. They harvest them, they sell it to a cooperative, but really don't know what the final product is. Uh, so again, and these are family-owned farms, so everybody in the family works in these farms. Uh, so perhaps the, the most important thing that the modern world has done for the cocoa industry is that they have been, uh, they, they are aware of this limitation of cocoa farming and cocoa production, and they have uh, developed very strong sustainability uh, programs. And these, uh, who developed these, were well, really the multinational companies that deal with cocoa, confectionery companies, have developed multi-billion programs to improve the sustainability and the fair trade. Uh, com e commerce of cocoa beans. And the whole idea is to improve uh, the yield of those cocoa plantations, to improve uh, the, the, the life of those trees, and to make sure that the farmers have a good living, right? That they, the kids can go to school, that they have water to drink, that they have good roads. Uh, and that's a very important, uh, really new uh, enterprise that has been launched by uh, cocoa producers. This is as new as, I believe the first uh, strong program was launched in 2014. So very important um, uh, activity or, uh, really triggered by uh, food companies. So, but let's go back to cocoa and uh, let's go a little summarize a little bit of how cocoa or chocolate is made, right? So as I said before, uh, everything starts on a tree. Uh, because uh, we need to grow that fruit that is called a cocoa pod. And uh, then once the cocoa pod is uh, ripe, we harvest that cocoa pod. And uh, the next step is to open the cocoa pods because these seeds are inside those cocoa pods. So here I have an example of a cocoa pod. This is dry 
Uh, if uh, you take my class in the fall, we actually have the luxury of bringing fresh cocoa pods and we open them and we taste the really fresh uh, seeds in there. Uh, but this has been uh, dried and varnished so that we can uh, keep it and maintain it and show it in shows like this. Uh, so you can see it looks like a squash and it has the shape of a football. And uh, if we cut it, so what they do is when they, in the farm, when they harvest these pods, they cut it in half, right? And inside you have a white substance. It looks like a, a jelly kind of substance. And that substance holds all the seeds, like the seed that you just had. So what they do is they grab all this and they put it on the floor. And they leave it on the floor on top of banana leaves. It depends a little bit on the facility, but some, sometimes they put it on boxes. But in West Africa, they, uh, in general, they put it on top of banana leaves. And they do what we call the fermentation process. And then in that fermentation process, that's a very important process because that's where the flavor precursors for chocolate flavor are going to start being developed. During that fermentation, a lot of bugs like yeast and microbes, different microbes are going to eat that white substance and they're going to start generating those flavor precursors that we're going to need later to develop that full flavor in the chocolate. So after fermentation, that it takes about seven days, uh, we're going to dry the beans and, and then companies like the chocolate factory buy those dry beans directly from the farm or from a cooperative. Once we receive those beans, we're going to roast them to fully develop that chocolate flavor. And we're going to put, uh, put them through a process that's called grinding and uh, conching. And we're going to go back to that in a little bit. And then we're going to crystallize that chocolate. We're going to cool it down so that it becomes solid. And that is what brings us to the final product, in our case, the agni chocolate. So, we talk about roasting and conching. So I want you to go back to that seed that you had before. And now I want you to open it. What I mean by open it, I want you to twist it and it's going to crack. It's going to crack and it's going to crumble. Hmm? So you can crumble it like that and you will see a part that is a shell that's the outside of the bean. And the inner part is what we call the nib. N-I-B, the nib. Hmm? This inner part is what we're going to use to make chocolate. And now you can smell it. Mmm, smells a lot better, right, than before. A lot more chocolate smell. Mm. And you can eat these nibs. These nibs are great. You can eat them like they are. You can put it in your granola mix. You can put it in your breakfast, in your cookies, in your cakes, whatever, in your ice cream. It's really good. Uh, so you, can, you, you will become addicted to these nibs. They're really good. So really the process of making chocolate is grinding. So if you look at these nibs, they are about maybe you know, one centimeter, depending on how big you're, they are, maybe it could be half centimeter. And you have a, one of the little baggies that you pick up also has full of nibs. So you can have a good idea of the size distribution of those nibs. So the process of making chocolate is really grinding those nibs all the way down to very, very, very small particle sizes. Why is that? Because if we leave the nibs big like this, when we put the chocolate in our mouth, it's going to feel grainy. And we don't want that. We want a chocolate that is very smooth and that we cannot feel the particles in our tongue. So we want to grind these nibs a lot, a lot, a lot to obtain that, something that is liquidy and we won't feel that graininess in our mouth. So again, those nibs are the important part for making chocolate. So once we have those nibs, uh, what we're going to do, we can, we can actually keep it grinding and what we obtain from that grinding that is a liquid, we call that cocoa liquor. Uh, it doesn't have any alcohol, it's just called liquor because it flows and it looks so nice and so luxury. Uh, and that cocoa liquor, we can press it and from that press, we can obtain cocoa powder and cocoa butter. So I want you to grab your packages that are labeled with a D and the package that is labeled with a C. The C is the cocoa powder, and that's the cocoa powder that you have at home that you use for making cookies or cakes or whatever. And, and the cocoa butter, it looks like white chocolate. It's not white chocolate. You can eat it. It's not very good. You're going to hate it. Uh, but uh, that's really the fat that is in that cocoa bean. Mm -hmm. And uh, with these ingredients then, with the cocoa liquor, 
uh, the cocoa powder, the cocoa butter, and with the addition of sugar and milk, if we want, that's how we make our chocolate. We put everything together. We continue grinding because, you know, the sugar still has large particle sizes and the milk also has large particles. So we continue grinding and then we go through a process called conching. And conching is not grinding. It grinding has already done when we go through the conching. But what conching does is that it steers the chocolate at very low speed so that you get a really good flavor distribution in the chocolate. That means that the flavor that was originally in the sugar can go into the cocoa particles. The flavor that is in the cocoa particles can go to the sugar and so on and so forth. It, it, it allows for a smooth flavor uh, um, distribution. So again, after conching, uh, then we cool it down and we get our chocolate product. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, we, we, can, uh, we can tailor uh, our chocolate by changing the recipe. Uh, as you know, there are different types of chocolate, milk, sweet, dark, semi-sweet. These are high, heavily regulated by FDA. It's, there's something called the Code of Federal Regulations that food scientists use a lot. So we have to uh, follow certain recipes to call something milk chocolate, for example. And of course, white chocolate also is a type of chocolate. So we're not going to go through this slide uh, with a lot of detail, but in case you want the, the, the specifics, it's here for you to look. But we talk about flavor, right? We talk about, we talk about molecules. So what do molecules have to do with chocolate? Well, the first thing is they impart flavor, right? Flavor really is a combination, in the case of chocolate, more than 600 molecules, lots of very complicated chemistry behind flavor. So what determines flavor? The type of bean, the origin of the bean. Here in the chocolate factory, we have three origins. We have beans from Ghana, uh, from um, um, Belize, and from Ecuador. And those are the little pots that if you pay the extra box, oops, uh, you should have them uh, in your package, right? And what I want you to do if you have these packages, uh, I want you to try this chocolate, uh, maybe later, and it's not too important to actually identify the flavor, but just to make sure that you, you, you realize that the flavors are so different. So these chocolates have, especially the Ghana, the Maya, and the one from Ecuador, have exactly the same recipe, but the difference is that the beans come from different origins. So depending on where you get your bean from, you can get a totally different flavor profile. So the beans, the type of bean and the origin of the bean is going to affect your flavor. The fermentation process is going to affect the flavor. The drying of the bean, the roasting of the bean, the conching of the bean, and of course the type of chocolate. So all these uh, processes or, 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 or variables can affect uh, the generation of these flavor compounds that are very important molecules that we need to identify to, uh, to, uh, to quantify uh, the flavor profile of a chocolate. But is flavor, is it, is flavor enough? Uh, is that why we eat chocolate? Yeah, flavor is a very important part, but also what we like from chocolate is the mouthfeel, how that chocolate feels in our mouth, how it melts when we eat it, and that uh, cooling sensation that it provides when we let the chocolate melt in your mouth. So who is responsible for that? And the component or the molecules are responsible come from cocoa butter. Uh, cocoa butter is the fat present in the cocoa bean or in the cocoa nib. And about 50% of that cocoa nib is cocoa butter. So quite a big amount, a large amount of fat in that cocoa nib. And uh, why uh, is cocoa butter so important and so characteristics of chocolate? Uh, because it has a very particular chemical composition, and it also has what we call polymorphism. And we're going to explain these two in a little bit, very briefly. So let's start by uh, the chemical composition. So as any fat, uh, cocoa butter are triacylglycerols. Uh, triacylglycerols are molecules that are formed by a glycerol molecule and has three fatty acids attached to that glycerol molecule. These fatty acids can be all the same or they can be all different. Mm -hmm. And if we want to represent the, the triacylglycerol in a simpler way, we have these blocks where the blue block is the glycerol, block, glycerol backbone and, uh, and then the fatty acids have three different colors. Uh, now, 
the, the funny thing is that these triacylglycerol kind of orient themselves in, a, in the form of on the shape of a chair, like we see here, where the fatty acids are the legs and the back, and the glycerol is uh, where we sit uh, at the bottom of the chair and part of the back. Hmm? So when we cool these triacylglycerols, what happens is they stack together, like if you are stacking chairs, exactly the same way. And this stacking is what creates a solid material, a very organized solid material, and those crystals that we see uh, when we grab a piece of fat. Uh, so one of the things that we use in food science to characterize fats is what we call a solid fat content curve. And I, that is the amount of solid fat that we have in our sample as a function of temperature. So for example, let's say that you have olive oil. Hmm? Uh, you have it in, in your countertop in the kitchen. It's liquid, right? It's liquid. You can see through, it behaves like, behaves like a liquid. Nobody doubts that it's a liquid. Now if you put that olive oil in the fridge and you leave it there for a, for a day or so, you're going to see that the olive oil starts getting a little bit turbid. And that is because we cooled it down and now we're going to, start, we're going to see crystals that start to be formed. So that turbidity is caused by those crystals that are floating around in your liquid olive oil. So that means that you have some solid fat that has been formed in there. Now, if we grab that same olive oil and we put it in the freezer, right, what's going to happen? It's going to look like a solid, right? It's going to, if you grab your, your pot of olive oil and you turn it around, it's not going to flow. It's going to be very, very, very solid. And that's because a lot more of those triacylglycerols crystallize. They form crystals, and now your, your oil is opaque, and it's hard. It looks like a solid. So that has a higher solid fat content. So with fats, as we decrease the temperature, we increase the solid fat content. Here is a picture of what crystals, fat crystals look like. Uh, we can see the bottom is all black, that is liquid oil. And everything, every time you see a, a shiny uh, speck, that is a crystal of fat. They look like stars, they're very, very pretty. I love fat crystals, they're so pretty, so cute. Um, so really, if we want to uh, describe then how a fat crystallizes as a function of temperature, uh, we have a very nice curve heel here. It's called a sigmoid sigmoidal curve, where you know a high temperature, you have something that is liquid, no crystals, and as, as we decrease the temperature, the amount of crystals start increasing. Now, for cocoa butter, cocoa butter has a very particular solid fat content curve. What does that mean? And we can, we can relate the solid fat content curve with the properties of the chocolate. So the solid fat content that we get at low temperatures, say below 25 degrees Celsius, that gives you a, a measurement of the hardness of the chocolate, how hard your chocolate is. So if you have a higher value here, the chocolate is going to be harder. If you have a lower value here, it's going to be softer. Now, the amount of solid fat that you get at temperatures above 35 degrees Celsius is going to give you a perception of waxiness. So you don't want, when you put your chocolate in your mouth, you want it to melt fast. If you have still some solid fat at, at body temperature, which is 37 degrees Celsius, it's going to feel like you're eating wax. It's not melting no matter how long you leave it in your mouth. So we don't want that. And cocoa butter has that property that doesn't have any solid fat at temperatures above 35 degrees Celsius. And then another important behavior is that it cool, when it cools, the solid fat content decreases very, very fast. And that gives us a cooling sensation, right? When you eat chocolate, you melt and you feel that cooling sensation and flavor release. And that is because as any material, when something melts, it absorbs heat. And because the chocolate is just melting in your mouth, the only way that it can absorb, uh, absorb heat is from your mouth. And that's why you feel that cooling sensation because it's absorbing, the heat is being absorbed by the, the chocolate to be melt. And uh, the, 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 the way it melts between 25 and 30 degrees Celsius, that gives you an idea of heat resistance. And this is important for uh, when you are developing a chocolate for countries that are very hot, like Brazil or Indonesia or India, and you, you don't want that chocolate to melt at room temperature. So you might want to use a cocoa butter that has a little bit more solid fat uh, in this range of temperatures. 
So again, so why cocoa butter? Why is cocoa butter so special? If you try to make a chocolate with any other fat, it's not going to be as good as uh, the chocolate made with cocoa butter. And that's because uh, cocoa butter has a very sharp melting point, like we said. It has a mild taste. It, has, it still has a little bit of a chocolatey taste, uh, and it's very brittle. I mean, one of the first things that we enjoy when we eat a piece of chocolate, especially, especially if it's dark chocolate, you break it, and you, you hear that snap. Right? And that's part of our eating um, experience, to hear that snap. That tells you that it's a very good chocolate. Now we talked about chemical composition and, and I'm not going to get into a lot of into this because it's probably too much, but we said that uh, fats are made by triacylglycerols and those triacylglycerols can have different fatty acids. So if you talk, for example, about milk fat, milk fat has a lot of different fatty acids in the triacylglycerols. Now cocoa butter triacylglycerols only have mainly, uh, about 80% of the composition is formed by stearic, oleic, and palmitic, so very specific uh, chemical composition, very narrow chemical composition. And this chemical composition is what allows the cocoa butter to melt fast and to have a high melting point and all those properties that we described before. And also it has an ideal, that solid fat content curve is ideal for chocolate. It allows for a good snap, flavor release, good mouthfeel, uh, it's hard enough and it's good to demold. If you have a chocolate that doesn't have cocoa butter, it's very hard to take it out of the mold. It's very glossy. If you have a really good chocolate, you can see how the chocolate shines on top. That's a really nice chocolate and that cooling sensation that we expect. So we talked that we said before that cocoa butter has two important properties, triacylglycerol composition and polymorphism. So let's talk about polymorphism. It sounds like a very difficult word, but it's not that bad and it's more common than you think. It's basically a way uh, molecules can orientate, uh, orient to form a crystalline structure. And the typical example that I like to give is when we, we look at graphite and carbon, right? So both graphite and carbon uh, sorry, graphite and diamond. <laughs> Both graphite and diamond are made of carbon, right? Same compound, same atom, but two totally different materials, right? Graphite is very soft, very cheap. Uh, diamond is very hard, very expensive. So why is one so hard and the other one is so soft? That's because the way those atoms orient in their crystalline structure is very different. If you look at this picture, in the diamond, the carbons are very tightly bound together, they are bound to each other in different ways, while in the graphite you have specific planes. And these layers of carbons are bound to each other, these layers are not bound to each other very tightly, allow for uh, this uh, material to be a lot softer and to deform a lot easier. So uh, we talked about polymorphism, right? So cocoa butter also is very polymorphic. What that means is that it can have different uh, crystalline structures. So cocoa butter has six different type of crystalline structures or polymorphism. It has one, two, three, four, five, and six. Very simple to remember the names. And the cool thing about this, and I, the thing that I want you to remember, is that each type of this polymorphic form has a different melting point. And we're going to talk about what melting point is in a little bit. But if you see, the melting point increases as we move towards the highest melting point. So for the, the crystalline structure number one has a lower melting point, and the, structure, the crystalline structure number six has a higher melting point. And that is because also the stability increases. So what, that, what does that mean? That means that if I crystallize cocoa butter in form two, it's not going to like it. The crystals are not very comfortable in there. They're not very comfy, so they want to go to form three, and then they want to go to form four and five and six. Six is the one that they like the most. If you get a cocoa butter in form six, you're good to go. The crystals are beautiful. They are happy. It's like they are in their couch watching TV. They don't want to move. Hmm? So the problem is that when we crystallize, when we make chocolate, a very important part of making chocolate is to cool it down and to crystallize that cocoa butter. So we don't want to get our form one. We don't want the two. We don't want the three. We don't want the form. We want the five. That is the form that we want. Why don't the six? 
Well, we don't really want the six because we really can't get form six from the melted chocolate. It's a little bit more complicated. So what you have to remember is that we really want that form five to form when we make chocolate. What's the difference between, for example, form four and form five at the molecular level is the way those molecules are organized. In the form four, for example, in this slide, you can see that you have, if you see the crystalline structure as a cube, you have one molecule in each corner and one in the center. While if you look at the form five, uh, is now the form five is not a cube, it's a little bit tilted, and you still have one molecule in each uh, corner, and you don't have a molecule in the middle. So the way those triacylglycerols orient is different between form four and form five. Very important difference in the type of polymorphism. So we talked about melting point. What is melting point? So remember we talk about triacylglycerols that they are shaped in the form of little chairs. So if when you, the triacylglycerols or the cocoa butter is in the liquid form, those chairs are scattered all over it. They're very disorganized. They, they have a lot of movement. They can swim around your liquid. Uh, very, very comfortable moving around. Now when you cool that fat, that means that your temperature goes below what we call the melting point. So the melting point is the temperature at which something uh, transforms from a liquid to a solid, or from the solid to a liquid. Mm -hmm. So what happens is when we put a sample at a temperature below your melting point, those chairs now are going to organize, like we said before, and they're going to stack each other mm -hmm, into layers. And that's going to form a solid. Mm -hmm. So what happens is when we cool that cocoa butter and we cool it, for example, at room temperature, right away you have melted cocoa, bu cocoa butter or chocolate and you put it at room temperature, what's going to, what is going to happen is going to crystallize in the form four, maybe a little bit in the form three. Hmm? But we said before that we don't want that form four. Why is that we don't want it? Because that form four, remember we said the molecules are not too comfortable there. They're going to want to go to the form five. So they're going to, when they do that, when they transform to that form four, five, uh, they develop a, 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 a defect in the chocolate that's called bloom. And bloom chocolate is if you have an old piece of chocolate in your house, that you probably forgot, that never happens to me because I eat my chocolate right away. Uh, but if you happen to have an old piece of chocolate, you will see that it's not shiny anymore. It has like a white layer on top. Some people think that's sugar, some people think that's mold, some people think that's flour, none of the above. It's cocoa butter. It's cocoa butter that has transformed from form four to form five. And you should have a little package in there called E, labeled with an E, and that is bloomed uh, chocolate. So you can see what it looks like and what that white uh, surface looks like. So what do we do then? How do we get that shiny chocolate? What we do is we cool it in a very controlled manner. It's called tempering. And that cooling, control cooling allows us to uh, obtain that form five directly. And that's the form five that we want. And the consequence is that we get a good chocolate that is very shiny and very uh, enjoyable, very snappy, has all the flavor release that we want. Mm -hmm. So this uh, slide shows a picture, a very cool picture on their uh, scanning electron microscope of fat bloom. And, um, and you can see all those spikes coming up. And uh, so basically, if we would grab that piece of chocolate with that white layer that is called fat bloom, you put it on the, micro on the electron microscope, you will see these beautiful spikes coming out. Very cool pictures. So what is that tempering? What is that control crystallization? Again, what we want to do is we want to obtain very small amount of that form five so that then when we finish cooling the chocolate, everything, all the crystals are in that form five. Um, so let's go into the process of tempering chocolate. So what we do, we start by melting our chocolate. So we heat it up at about, you know, 122 Fahrenheit. And once we leave it there for a little bit to make sure all the cocoa butter is melted, we cool it. So at that point when it's melted, we only have co what we call cocoa solids. So basically the, the cocoa liquor with all the fat that is melted and sugar, because sugar is an important ingredient of the chocolate. And if you're making milk chocolate, you will have milk particles in there. 
So once everything is melted, we cool it. And we cool it to a temperature of about 81 degrees Fahrenheit. And what that allows, what, what that does is it, it induces the crystallization of form four and form five. Why is that? Because we do want the, the form five, but if we want to crystallize only the form five, it's going to take forever. It takes too much time, too long time. So at this point, we generate crystals of both form four and a tiny little bit of form five. And here in this graph, you can see the form uh, four are uh, depicted like a, a circle and the form five like a little um, uh, rectangles or, or, or uh, yeah, or lines. Hmm? Uh, but then once we have those mainly form four and a little bit of form five, what we do is we heat up the chocolate a little bit, just a tiny little bit, just enough to melt that, uh, those crystals that are in form four and only leave the crystals that are in form five. Mm? And those are the crystals that we want. So if we look at this diagram here, we see now the cocoa solids and just those lines that are representing the form five crystals. Mm? And then we, we only, at this point, we only have about 3% of crystals, but then when we cool the chocolate all the way down, all the other uh, cocoa butter triacylglycerols are going to crystallize in that form five. So as a summary uh, of, of this talk, I just want you to remember that uh, cocoa has been around for a long time. Not as much chocolate, but cocoa has been around for more than 3,000 years. And uh, really that chocolate quality and experience, eating experience is driven not only by flavor, but also by texture and mouthfeel of the chocolate. And this mouthfeel and texture is driven by the fat that is present in cocoa, which is called cocoa butter. And uh, that, that cocoa butter, what it's going to do is going to crystallize when we make chocolate and that is going to be uh, what drives uh, th those texture and mouthfeel properties of the chocolate. And, uh, and those molecular molecules and molecular structures that are formed while we crystallize the chocolate is what, what really drives that quality and eating experience on the chocolate itself. Of course, if you want to learn more, uh, come to the Chocolate Factory. We are always happy to give you a tour. We can show you all the different piece of, pieces of equipment that we use to process chocolate. We can tell you more about the science of chocolate and uh, we can show you around. We'll be very happy to, to welcome you at the factory. Thank you. And thank you, Silvana, for, for a great talk. Thank you. And, and you know, I, I think you've learned a lot. I certainly have about the science and sensation of chocolate. And you know, I'll never look at a piece of chocolate the same way mm -hmm. again. Yes, <laughs> that's a goal. Pretty good, good, pretty <laughs> I'm still going to enjoy it, for sure. One thing before we transition to our question and answer period that I forgot, it's my fault in the introduction, is the context of Silvana's talk. How does a talk on the science of chocolate fit into Brave New World? Well, it doesn't, but it kind of does in an interesting way. So Silvana, you were slated to give a talk last year when our brave new world uh, came to be with the COVID pandemic. So Silvana's talk uh, on food okay, last year was canceled and we were lucky to be able to have you speak this year in the brave new world series. Mm -hmm. So thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. We'll transition over to the question and answer period and look forward to your questions. Thanks. We are live. Thanks for tuning in tonight. And a lot of people did, so I, I, I really appreciate it. I hope you liked the talk as much as I did, and I liked it a lot. Don't forget, too, that uh, chocolate samples are still available at the Aggie Chocolate Factory, so if you haven't picked up your sample, uh, there's still time, and you can watch the talk again and eat along. <laughs> so, Silvana, thank you. So some questions have come in, and please send some more questions in. We will take questions for 15 minutes uh, or until we run out. So please give us some questions. You know, I often start with the bad news first, and that's the way we'll do things tonight. So a question came in, Silvana. Is cocoa butter a healthy fat? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> I get that question all the time. Uh, not really. Uh, so you told so, news, <laughs> sorry. Bad news, you know. But you know, the idea is to eat chocolate, a little bit of chocolate, so mm -hmm. it's not that bad for you. Mm -hmm. But cocoa butter has a lot of what we call saturated fatty acids 
they are not very good for us. Um, so they are not as bad as trans fatty acids, who maybe some of you heard about, uh, but they are not ideal. It's not like an olive oil that we want to eat without you know any problem. You know, cocoa butter. We have to limit the consumption of cocoa butter if we can. Yeah. So eat in moderation. Eat in moderation. Yeah. A pound or two a day. Yeah, and, right. and then somebody told me I was talking about this with somebody today. And they say, well, maybe chocolate is not as healthy for you know, your well-being, but it's healthy for your brain and for your emotions. So if it makes you feel good, there's nothing yeah, good about yeah, eating yeah, chocolate. Yeah, it makes you feel good, yeah, that's good. So another question, one of the earlier ones that came in. So why do farmers use banana leaves for cocoa pot fermentation? And does it affect the flavor? So the farmers, cocoa leaves are mainly used in farms in West Africa. And they're used uh, just to separate the beans from the grounds. Because if you just put them directly on the ground, they will just get messed up with all the other leaves and everything else. So it's like a, like a tarp. Sometimes, sometimes they use a tarp instead of, uh, uh, of banana leaves. Um, and they really don't affect the flavor per se. What they're going to affect is the environment. So the fermentation process is affected heavily by, for example, the airflow and the temperature of the beans. So if you put, for example, a tarp, or, or if you uh, ferment in, in, in uh, boxes, in wood boxes, which happens in South America, um, really the flavor is not going to change that much, but what is going to change is the temperature, the airflow through uh, the beans, and of course the bacteria and the yeast that are involved in the fermentation, which definitely affect the flavor. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So a question about the Aggie chocolate factory. So what is it that makes the Aggie chocolate so good and so unique and Here's the other side. Why does it cost more than candy bars found in convenience stores? Well, the cool thing about the there are so many cool things about the <laughs> yeah, Aggie Chocolate yeah. Factory that I can't just <laughs> have can talk about in only a few minutes. But the cool thing is that the Aggie Chocolate Factory was developed as a teaching, a research, and an outreach tool. Uh, so uh, about 90% of our employees are students. Uh, so um, we have a student that also gives this, this uh, quote that I really like and says when you're buying a piece of chocolate at the Aggie Chocolate, you're not only buying chocolate, you're, you, you're buying a student experience. So we, the, the idea of the chocolate factory is not only to use it for our class that we teach on the fall, where we have about 120 students coming through, but also uh, to give opportunities to food science students to learn about food production, uh, things that happen in a production plan, and things like uh, legal issues and SOPs and HACCP plans. So it really has a very strong educational component. Uh, why is it so expensive, or not so expensive, but more expensive than your typical bar that you buy in the store? Well, everything is made by hand. Uh, from We select the beans from scratch, we make sure that we use the best uh, beans that we can, and, uh, and then we do everything by hand, and, and that takes time. And uh, we bring uh, beans from different parts of the world, and that, that, all, that is also expensive. And uh, so that's why it's a little bit more expensive than uh, buying a chocolate bar from the store. We are about the same price range as any other single origin. So our chocolate is single origin. That means that all the beans come from the same farm. Uh, if you buy a chocolate from uh, the store that is not single origin, the beans come from all over the place. Right? So that's, that's a very important thing. We are very committed to sustainability and fair trade. So uh, all of our beans are, are fair trade certified and organic. Uh, so that we make sure, like I, I said in the talk, we make sure that the, the farmers are well treated and we, go, we, we get back to those farmers and those community, communities. Yeah, excellent. Mm -hmm. so, so the old adage is true, you, you get what you pay for. Yeah, totally. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see. I'm going to check these in, in, uh, in rough order of which they came in. So can food chemists find good careers? Oh, yeah. Totally. Mm -hmm. All our students find really, really good jobs uh, from you know, local small companies to multinational companies all over the country and all over the world. And mm -hmm. all of our students, 100% of our students have good placement and really good salaries. <laughs> you remember that. Yeah, and you get, to, you, get, you get to eat your experiments, so it's good. I'm sorry I'm so late in my career. It might be time for a career change <laughs> it's otherwise. Never, yeah, it's no, never no, too late. No, yeah, too late. <laughs> so Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so do, uh, this is an interesting rivalry question, question. Do the Aggie chocolate people have a rivalry with the Aggie ice cream people? Oh, yeah. We're all for it. No, no, no. I'm kidding. <laughs> we actually, last December, we have a project together where we develop uh, 
um, chocolate for one of, the, of their flavors. And we also develop a chocolate to dip their ice, their cones, the ice cream cones. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about more projects together. So mm -hmm. very good friends, but hopefully one day we can beat them. No, I, I'm kidding. I get there's some interesting <laughs> physical chemistry and the idea of getting a dipping chocolate. Yeah, ice cream yeah, cones. there is. It's not that easy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's great. <laughs> So what's the difference between stage five and stage six in the polymorphic crystals? It's that the difference is the way the molecules organize and mm -hmm. also in the melting point. So the form six, it has a little bit higher melting point. Mm -hmm. So if you have a form six in your chocolate, it also takes a little bit longer to melt in your mouth. So you will have a little bit more of that waxy sensation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. So here's an opinion question. What's your favorite chocolate? Ah, I get that all the time. <laughs> yeah. I need chocolate. Ah, <laughs> of course, right? Let's, let's dig deeper. <laughs> really, um, I really like the Ghana that we have in the mm -hmm. factory. It's a very nice combination of uh, fruitiness and, and dark chocolate mm. flavors. So, you know, even though most of our chocolates are 70% dark, they're not mm. very bitter. And uh, because we, we select our beans so that they develop these fruity kind of uh, brownie flavors, uh, they, they, they decrease the bitterness quite a bit. So, mm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I better try that one. Mm -hmm. So, let's see. So, I like the song Cocoa Butter Kisses, and that's all I really knew about cocoa butter, but now I know a lot more. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you. What's the difference between dark milk and white chocolate? So the difference is the, the, the recipes, right? Mm -hmm. So dark chocolate, well, there are a lot of different uh, combinations, and I don't want to get into a lot of detail, but there are a lot of regulations uh, from the Code of Federal Regulations from the FDA for food scientists. But just in a nutshell, uh, for example, the 70% cocoa that we make in the factory has 70% of that nib, mm -hmm. right? that has been ground, and 30% sugar, that's it. If you go to a store and you buy a 70% uh, cocoa uh, chocolate, then that chocolate might have you know, 70%. That 70% comes from the nib, from the cocoa powder. They can add some cocoa butter. And those three things account for that 70%. So you can have a lot of, you can have four or five chocolates that are all 70%, but by changing slightly those uh, ingredients, you get different flavors. Mm -hmm. Uh, milk chocolate has milk, so has, it has less of that cocoa liquor, of that nib, and uh, it has more uh, cocoa butter and has, also has milk, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and white chocolate doesn't have any nibs, right? That's why it's white. So you have cocoa butter, you have sugar, and you have milk. So those are the three ingredients. And of course, in all of them, a lot of people put vanilla, uh, put lecithin. Lecithin is a molecule that we add to chocolate to make it less viscous, uh, so it flows better. Uh, in, a, in the factory, we don't put any vanilla and we don't put any lecithin because we try to keep it simple and, uh, and a very uh, clear label. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So let's see, what is, what is the difference between the colors of the foil wrap chocolates oh, good in point. the extra pack? Yeah, so the, the, the yellow one is the Ghana. So okay. those are beans that come from Ghana. Your favorite. Yeah, my favorite. Okay. And then the green one comes from uh, Belize. It's mm -hmm. our Maya Mountain. Maya Mountain is the name of the farm. Uh, the light purple is from Costa Esmeralda. It's a farm from Ecuador. So those three are 70% dark. So mm -hmm. they are 70% cocoa and 30% sugar. And the dark purple is the Costa Esmeralda with milk. So mm -hmm. it's a milk version of the Costa Esmeralda. Um, so one thing uh, for those that have that package is would be is interesting to try them all together, especially the three dark, so the purple, the light purple, the green, and the yellow, mm -hmm. or the golden, and 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 try to notice the differences. Probably it's going to be hard to identify, to pinpoint, or to name the difference, but just be aware that they're different, mm -hmm. and that difference comes from the origin of the bean only because our recipe is the same, mm -hmm. right? So that, that tells you how important where you get the beans are. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Silvana. So what's the difference between cocoa and cacao? I get that, all the questions. So really cacao is the Spanish version of cocoa, mm -hmm. right? So cacao is a Sp Spanish word and cocoa is an English word. Mm -hmm. So same thing, a lot of people use uh, cacao, including us, uh, as a marketing kind of uh, sounds you know fancy and mm -hmm. weird and uh, unique. So a lot of people use cacao, but really it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. So the old a rose is a rose by any name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Is it true that Aggie Chocolate Factory has a red chocolate? 
We do, it's pink. It's called oh, yeah. ruby chocolate. Mm -hmm. And it's a very new chocolate. And uh, if you come to the, to the factory, we, we have some, uh, some uh, chocolate there for sale. Uh, and it's a new variety of cocoa. It's very, very new. It probably has been available for the last maybe two years. It was created by a company called Barry Calibut. They are the major uh, producers of cocoa in the world. And again, it's a new variety of cocoa and they also change a little bit the fermentation. They don't want to tell us too much because everything is straight secret and they have a lot of patent on there. Uh, but it's a, really, it's a very fruity uh, flavor, very berry-like uh, flavor. So if you're into trying new chocolates, come and try one. It's, it's outstanding. Okay. It's very Excellent. good. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I'm, I'm I have to pay the chocolate factory a visit. Mm -hmm. So can the factory offer cacao powder for sale? I would like to be able to make my own sugar-free confections. Oh, yeah. So we're working on that. Mm -hmm. Right now we have a, a hot cocoa mix. So the cacao powder comes mm -hmm. with sugar and everything else. We do have a cocoa press. So to obtain cocoa powder, you need to press that cocoa liquor and separate the fat from the cocoa powder. Um, and uh, we're working on that. We're optimizing the process so that we can uh, make it available to the public. So. Oh, hold on in there, maybe in a couple, okay. maybe in the summer, after Soon. the okay. summer. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Let's see, how is stage six created? So in the polymorphic crystals. Yeah, the only way we can create form uh, six is through the transformation from forms five. So we first need to create the form five and then basically store it for a long period of time or maybe do uh, sub subject the chocolate to temperature fluctuations that help helps, and then the form five will transform into form six. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And then this is a question about hours. So what are the days and times the chocolate factory is open? So the chocolate factory is open Mondays through fr Fridays, 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. And on Saturdays, it's open 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. And I think, okay, this may be our last question that we've gotten. So. Thank you very much. Thank you, Silvana. And again, this is the close of the Brave New World series. Uh, and I can't wait for next year, okay, where we'll look at science on the horizon. So see you back for Science Unwrapped in our next year's talks. So thanks very much and good night. Thank and you. Thank you, Silvana. Thank you, Greg.